everybody, and welcome to another Books and Coffee discussion. I'm Emma Oxford, Director of Community Relations, and I'm really pleased to see so many of you here tonight, coming from uh, far and wide. And special welcome to the Friends of Concordia, whose generosity helps to support this series and many other programs at the college. If you didn't fill out one of those uh, purple raffle cards earlier, uh, please raise your hand and we'll get one to you now. The prize tonight is, is a copy of the book we're discussing. The prize will be a hardback copy, but the book is actually just out in paperback, and I hope everybody will buy one at the end of the talk and have it signed by our author. So I am absolutely thrilled to welcome the author of Crosses to Concordia College. A few weeks ago, I mentioned to uh, someone who I think is in the audience tonight that Philip could Caputo would be speaking at the college, and he said, do you mean the Philip Caputo? <laughs> well, yes, I did, and here he is tonight, and uh, we are really pleased to see him. He is one of the most thoughtful writers of our generation. Phil was raised in Chicago. He served as a Marine Lieutenant in the Vietnam, and went on to spend nine years as a reporter with the Chicago Tribune. In 1972, he shared a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on election fraud in Chicago. In 1975, while serving as a foreign correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, he was wounded in Beirut and during his convalescence completed a rumor of war about his service in Vietnam. This extraordinary memoir became a classic and has sold more than two million copies since its publication in 1977. Since then, Phil has written books and magazine articles full-time, publishing seven other works of fiction, including Acts of Faith, another memoir, and four works of nonfiction. He divides his time between his home in Connecticut and Arizona, and with him tonight is his uh, lovely wife, Leslie, Phil's love of the border state Arizona really jumps off the page throughout the novel Crosses. Well, I read Crosses this summer, and it was one of those books that I really didn't want to end because you get so engaged with the characters and it's so dramatic, uh, and uh, I, I loved it. It was, in the words of one critic, a gorgeously stark novel set on the Arizona-Mexico border. Phil weaves many themes into what's a multi-generational tale of an investment banker who's distraught over the loss of his wife on 9-11 and seeks refuge on his family's Arizona ranch. But rather than finding peace and tranquility, he's drawn into conflicts that plague the borderlands, illegal immigration, drug smuggling, and his own family's dark past. I can't wait to hear Phil talk about his, this, his latest novel, and after he's spoken, he'll take your questions, please make them brief, and speak into the mics that we'll pass around the audience. Thank you so much, Phil, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Well, thank you, uh, Emma, for having me here, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I think I can get you out of here on time for the sixth inning. <laughs> so the other day, while I was shaving, I looked at myself and I asked, are you a dinosaur or an atavism? I went to my Webster's. Its third definition of dinosaur is someone or something thought to be old-fashioned, outmoded, resistant to change. An atavism is, quote, the appearance in an individual of a characteristic found in a remote ancestor, but not in nearer ancestors. Well, maybe in my case it was a distinction without a difference. Anyway, I've concluded that I'm a little bit of both, kind of a protruding Neanderthal brow, and a Tyrannosaurus rex scaled down, way down to five feet six, and 170 pounds. Now my lack of eyes is what makes me a dinosaur. 
No iPhone, no iPad, <laughs> no iPod. Although I do have a laptop and uh, I think it's here somewhere, a cell phone. Yes, here it is, and it's the kind that makes telephone calls. <laughs> this observation, which appeared in a profile about me a few years ago, <coughs> proves I'm an atavism, and I'll quote from it, like muscle cars and bomber jackets, they don't make them like Phil Caputo anymore. <laughs> he was referring to my writing methods. My first drafts are composed in longhand. To my writing style, it's pretty much conventional, straightforward stuff with recognizable characters, a plot, and language that doesn't leave readers scratching their heads or consulting a Rosetta Stone to decipher my meaning. And also to my education and employment, I don't have a Master's of Fine Arts degree in creative writing, and I don't teach creative writing. Which may be a good thing, because despite the dismal plunge in literacy, MFA programs in this country are cranking out more writers every year than the entire Romantic and Victorian periods put together. But I learned my craft as a newspaper man, and I continue to practice journalism. And I got to say, I'm proud to have apprenticed in the newsroom instead of the classroom. In moments of self-dramatization and ego reinforcement, and I'll point out that writers' egos are like, well, like dinosaur eggs. They're large but fragile. I see myself as an heir to an honorable tradition of the journalist novelists that produced Mark Twain, Stephen Crane, Theodore Dreiser, Damon Runyon, John Despasos, John Steinbeck, and Ernest Hemingway, among others. White males all, and very dead. Like I said, an atavism. Now, there have been disadvantages to my newsman training. I have a habit of informing my readers in my fiction. I can't resist telling them things. And I don't trust the story quite often to simply tell itself. However, there are advantages. Journalism's taught me the virtues of clarity and accuracy in the use of language. Near misses don't count when it comes to choosing the right word. And as for lucidness, I think writing ought to call attention to its subject and not to itself. To my mind, reading someone like Alice Munro, for example, is far more rewarding than thrashing through the impenetrable stylistic jungles of, say, a Thomas Pynchon. Journalism is also profitable. No, it's not Wall Street investment banker profitable. But writing magazine pieces and nonfiction books bridges the chasms in my earnings from fiction. I've published novels that put me, at least for a little while, in the upper 5% income bracket. And I have published others that would have made me eligible for food stamps <laughs> if they were all I had to rely on. But journalism's main benefit is this. It provides me with an answer to the question all writers are asked, the question they dread to hear, where do you get your ideas? In my wise guy moments, I sometimes reply, well, I just Google ideas.com and <laughs> scroll down the menu. But I'm not going to be a wise guy tonight. In me, the realms of fact, fact and fiction, of the empirical and the imaginative, occupy the same mental space at the same time and sustain each other. In the spirit of the new journalism, which is anything new nowadays, I've used the techniques of fiction in writing nonfiction. My first book, which Emma mentioned, A Rumor of War, has often been mistaken for an autobiographical novel because of its structure and dramatic tension, but it is a memoir, as factual as my memory could make it. On the other hand, I have gotten a lot of ideas for novels and stories, for, I mean, for novels from stories I've covered as a reporter and a foreign correspondent. My first one, Horn of Africa, published in 1980, grew out of an assignment for the Chicago Tribune 
uh, back in 1975, covering the Eritrean rebellion in Ethiopia. My seventh novel, Acts of Faith, out of a reporting trip to Kenya and Sudan for National Geographic that I made in 2001. And some years before that, I had covered a horrendous mass murder in Stockton, California for Esquire magazine, and that experience gave birth to my one attempt at crime fiction, Equation for Evil. The book I'm talking about tonight, Crossers, is likewise the child of a marriage between fact and fiction. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit of how I came to write it and why. Now to summarize, Emma mentioned some of it, but I'll uh, be a bit repetitious here. To summarize, Crossers is a novel about grief and the conquest of grief. It's a love story, a family saga, and a thriller. And I'll, I'll mention in passing that keeping all those balls in the air while I was writing it was like juggling bowling pins with one arm. The central character is Gil Castle, a New York investment banker who falls apart after losing his wife in the attack on the World Trade Center. Gil retreats to the San Ignacio, a sprawling ranch in southern Arizona pioneered by his mother's ancestors and now run by a cousin, Blaine Erskine. There, Castle begins to rebuild his life through the love of a neighboring rancher, Tessa McBride. Meanwhile, he learns some dark truths about his maternal grandfather, Benjamin Erskine, a fearsome character whose lifespan went from the last twilight of the Old West to the high noon of the 20th century. Ben was once described by his daughter, Gill's mother, as a man who had outlived his time but didn't know it. A Mexican illegal alien shows up on the San Ignacio one morning, terrified after a border crossing drug deal has gone bad. Gill, against his cousin's wishes, takes him in. And yet, Gill's act of compassion unleashes a flood of violence and vengeance exacted by a vicious narcotics queen named Yvonne Menendez. Yvonne is determined to make Gill and Blaine pay a blood debt incurred 50 years ago by their grandfather. Gill, who has moved to Arizona to escape his tragic past, learns from her that he cannot escape his own family's bloody past. He also learns that on the border, the line between good and evil isn't as clear as the border itself with its barbed wire and barricades and boundary posts. That lesson comes from a mysterious, renegade drug enforcement agent, half British, half Mexican, who goes by several aliases, but is mostly known by his nickname, The Professor. So how did I come to write this tale? Well, Leslie and I, my wife, live part of the year in Patagonia, Arizona. It's a small town southeast of Tucson, 18 miles north of the Mexican border. The atavist in me fell in love with the place. It's an old mining and cow town surrounded by sprawling cattle ranches where even in this digitized age, you can see cowboys trailing herds on horseback. The starkly beautiful landscape, high desert plateaus and grasslands, mountains soaring to 10,000 feet, has provided the setting for any number of westerns. But if it looks like, the old, uh, like a piece of the Old West preserved in amber, it's very much a part of the New West. Some of those wide open ranges are every day being chopped up into 10-acre ranchettes for retirees, and the whole area has become a corridor for smuggling drugs and illegal immigrants. Leslie and I have encountered them often on hikes and horseback rides. Well, for some time, I had had a vague notion of writing a novel set in our neck of the desert, but I had nothing in the way of plot or characters until, through a ranching couple we know, I came into possession of a yellowed typewritten manuscript about a man named Jim Hathaway. It wasn't signed, but the author evidently was Hathaway's son, now deceased. As I read through this reminiscence, I grew fascinated with Hathaway, 
who was born when Arizona was still a frontier territory and died in the 1950s. He was like a lot of the border rats who lived in Arizona, uh, Arizona's territorial days, a cowpuncher, a miner, an outlaw turned lawman, a soldier of fortune who'd fought alongside Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution. It was said that he killed at least a dozen men, the last one in a gunfight in 1951 when Hathaway was in his early 60s. Accounts of this duel read like the Earp brothers' gunfight at the OK Corral, except that the participants in this one rode in in pickup trucks rather than on horses. It was hard to tell if Hathaway was a good guy who sometimes went bad or a bad guy who sometimes went good. That's what captivated me. All my writing career, I've dealt with the themes of moral conflict and moral ambiguity. And an idea for an historical novel began to take shape with a fictionalized version of Hathaway as its protagonist. That's how Ben Erskine came into being. Now, writing a novel is hard work, punishing sometimes. The fun part is researching, gathering material, as it used to be called. And the skills I acquired as a journalist have proved invaluable. Trying to learn as much as I could about Hathaway and his times, I interviewed old timers who'd known him when they were children, delved into archives and newspaper clips as brittle as dried leaves, and picked up bits and pieces of border lore wherever I could find them. Well then, a funny thing happened on my way to writing an historical novel. The Virginia Quarterly Review called and asked if I could contribute 10,000 words to an issue they were devoting to the current situation on the border. I was struggling with the book, really getting nowhere, so I made a quick transition out of the past and into the present, out of the imaginary world tr I was trying to create into the real world. Doing the article required a lot of old-fashioned, hands-on, shoe-leather reporting, some of it dangerous. I accompanied U.S. Border Patrol agents on two undercover missions in Mexico, as well as on patrols on this side of the border. One agent, a close friend of mine, gave me extensive tutorials on the Mexican drug trade and on the rings who traffic in illegal immigrants. I was struck by the similarity between the drug cartels and Islamist terrorists. The latter are motivated by political and religious fanaticism, the former by greed, but their brothers under the skin in their cruelty and utter disregard for human life. They're alike even in their methods, beheadings, videotaping executions just to show the world what they're capable of. I also spoke to migrants, and the stories they told about their journeys were beyond heartbreaking. Tales of survival and suffering that made the Joad's travels in the Grapes of Wrath sound like a family vacation. One involved a Guatemalan who exported fruits and vegetables to the U.S. His little business went belly up after 9-11 because U.S. airspace was closed and entire year's crop rotted on the tarmac, ruining him. Three years later, after scrimping and saving to pay a coyote, as immigrant smugglers are called, he crossed illegally into the United States. The coyote abandoned him in the mountains in the middle of winter. He got lost trying to find his way and was nearly dead when a rancher I know rescued him. So I finished the article, which was published in the Virginia Quarterly Re Review edition of uh, spring 1907. And I'd learned a lot, and what I'd learned changed my plans for the novel. For a while, I considered writing two, one set in the past from 1903 to 1951, with Ben Erskine as its central figure, and a modern-day sequel that would tell the stories of his descendants. That approach didn't work. Somehow, one tale taking place in yesteryear and another in the present lost power standing alone. So better, I thought, to fuse the two. The historical story would be part one, the contemporary story part two. But soon enough, I realized that wasn't going to work either. It was too linear, too mechanical. 
too schematic. It also violated the spirit of the book, which was to show that the past is never dead, that it constantly affects the present, kind of like, like the way a gravitational field in an invisible black hole affects the motions of a visible star. Moreover, telling two stories in one was going to stretch the book out to unmanageable length. I wrestled with this problem for a long time, which, as Leslie could tell you, created mood swings that made me an unpleasant life's companion. For a while, I, I escaped into more research. Crossers was supposed to take place on a ranch, but what I knew about cattle ranching was pretty much limited to watching Lonesome Dove a couple of times. Putting my reporter hat back on, I interviewed cattlemen about the business side of ranching, joined them on a couple of roundups, and helped brand calves in noisy, dusty corrals. Tough work, but it was fun to yell whoopee tie i o and play cowboy at age 64. But then it was out of the saddle and back into a desk chair to grapple with the problem of telling two stories in one without producing a book as long as the Old Testament. Then an unexpected source showed me the way out of this dilemma. One day, from out of nowhere, an old Arizona cowboy, T.J. Babcock, began to tell me about himself. His first words appear in the book exactly as he spoke them to me, and I'll read them now. I have lived longer than I deserve, been shot at and missed and shit on and hit, if you'll pardon the language, but I am still on the right side of the ground and looking age 80 square in the eye. I have seen a great many changes too, and I cannot keep up with them anymore. I was born in Bisbee, Arizona, just two years after they captured Geronimo. And as a boy, I knew fellas, Mexicans and Americans who'd been in scrapes with the A-patch. But only last year, I was down to Phoenix and saw a jet airliner taken off. There is no name to go with the J that is my middle initial. My ma and pa, in what must have been a fit of insanity, named me Thaddeus, but didn't give me a middle name. I got made fun a lot, so I started to call myself T. But that didn't sound quite right, so I added the J, and all who have known me since know me as TJ. Well, TJ went on from there, relating his adventures fighting alongside Ben Erskine in the Mexican Revolution. I didn't write his story down. I was a mere recording secretary taking dictation. But what exactly was he dictating? Pretty soon I realized that it was an oral history, which he gave in 1966 to the Arizona Historical Society. And he gave me the solution to the length problem. I could compress ben, Ben's story spanning half a century into a little more than 100 pages by presenting it as a series of oral histories told by different people. Ben's older brother, Jeffrey, his daughter, Grace, his Mexican side, sidekick, Martin Mendoza, a retired newspaper reporter, Tim Forbes, and of course, T.J. Babcock. Now like the others, he was pure figment, though he was as real to me as any of you sitting in front of me right now. Discovering him was a delight it was one of those moments that make writing fiction worth all the sweat and anxiety. Now, nowadays, some journalism schools teach a course that's called creative nonfiction, which I gather is the art of telling whoppers costumed as truth. But even by the loosest professional standards, a character like TJ could never be introduced into a piece of nonfiction. Which brings me to the why of this novel. Since I'd done all that reporting and research for VQR, filling up a dozen file folders, each a couple of inches thick, why not expand the magazine article into a factual book? Why go through all the trouble of making things up? And it is trouble. 
Journalism is easier than fiction because all your raw material is there. The writer only has, has to shape it and write it as well as he or she can. Novelists have to create their raw material. It's as if a sculptor had to make the stone from which he carves his statue. Now it's true, some of the characters and scenes in Crossers are based on real people and actual events. For example, the lost migrant whom Gil Castle rescues, Miguel Espinoza, is modeled on the Guatemalan I mentioned just a few minutes ago, real name Eduardo Flores. Late in the book, to cite another example, the character called the professor observes that the US effort to control the border relies on gadgets and gizmos. He thinks to himself, Star Wars joining hands with the Old West, two myths linked by the gringo faith and technology to overcome, the Winchester repeating rifle that cleared the plains of buffalo and Indians, ancestor to the electronic sensors and infrared cameras that keep the Mexicans out. The professor's reflections rose out of a scene I witnessed one night in a border patrol station. Inside, operators manipulated remote cameras positioned in the desert miles away. The cameras relayed images to TV screens that covered an entire wall. On one screen, a group of illegals could be seen creeping through the brush. On another, border patrolmen on horseback wearing cowboy hats and night vision goggles. A camera operator directed the mountain, mounted agents by radio, and pretty soon they galloped off one screen onto another. And I watched them capture the border crossers. Except for the greenish glow on the screen, I might have been watching a western where the cavalry rounds up a band of renegade Apaches. The fusion between that Old West image and 21st technology was mind-blowing. But back to the question, why a novel instead of nonfiction? Well, I have found over the years that the imagination can shed a brighter and even a clearer light on the truth than a rigid adherence to factual reality. Put it this way, I think that fiction, if it's done right, can be truer than fact. I know we tend to equate truth with fact, but nothing could be further from the truth you'll excuse that little pun. Think about it. Every day, the news media bombard us with facts, many of which later turn out to be untrue. You read in the Times an article about a medical study that presents as gospel the beneficial effects of a new drug. Two weeks later, you read that another study has proven beyond doubt that the drug will kill you. In other words, we're confronted daily with the unsettling realization that the, un that the facts we embraced last year or last month or only yesterday were illusions. And our belief in their veracity was, therefore, little more than superstition. Circumstances change, human nature and emotions don't. And the truths about our nature are what the novelist must focus on. As Faulkner said, the human heart in conflict with itself is the writer's subject. The emotions that move and divide our hearts. Love and the need to love, hate and the need to hate. Greed, ambition, pride, fear, jealousy, pity, cruelty, courage, cowardice have done so ever since some hairy biped rose up off his knuckles and strode upright across the African plains. In writing Crossers, I wanted to illuminate what life is like on the border today and what it was like in the past. It seemed I could do that best by getting into the minds and hearts of the characters, and, the, and only my imagination could open that door. But I was after something more. I wanted to write about other kinds of borders, moral and psychological frontiers. The protagonist, Gil Castle, is crippled by grief, but crosses into reconciliation, redeemed by Tessa's love 
and by the recognition that he has embraced his sorrow in place of the wife he lost. In his antagonist, Yvon Menendez, I portray a woman who has become a monster consumed by greed and the need for vengeance. And in Ben Erskine, a man whose heart truly is in conflict with itself. He passes from good to evil and back to good. So often there seems to be no distinction between them. But there is, and Ben becomes the father whose sins fall upon the sons. These and all the other characters are inventions pretending to be real people. And their stories are not the truth, but my vision of the truth masquerading as a lie. Now, if any of you are kind enough to buy Crossers, and even kinder to read it, I will then leave it to you to judge how good a liar I am. Thanks. I'll take the questions. Thank you, Phil. We, uh, we have some time for questions, and uh, Andrew and I will pass around the microphones, and uh, when you have the microphone in your possession, that's uh, your chance to ask a question. So, uh, starting over here, <laughs> my husband, Mike Elliott. <laughs> Phil, you... Uh, became known, of course, uh, for A Rumor of War, a work of nonfiction, uh, and then as an extraordinarily distinguished journalist. What was the first moment when you thought you wanted to do fiction? I mean, I was just... This is on. Yeah. Yeah. What, was, what, was, what was the... Was there, a, was there a moment when you thought doing factual stuff, doing nonfiction just isn't enough, and this thing that I've seen or this thing that I've felt uh, requires me to develop an extra set of skills? Well, I had, uh, I mean, I had dabbled in, uh, in, in fiction before when I was in school and that sort of thing. And you know, um, uh, Michael is, uh, works for uh, uh, Time Magazine. He's a journalist, and as you well know, um, every newspaper man and woman always says there's a novel in me somewhere. I mean, you never hear about a novelist saying there's a newspaper story in me somewhere. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I had sort of maybe always felt that, but it was really after I had got back from uh, Ethiopia, and I had some experiences over there that, you know, might have made an interesting magazine piece, if told straight. But I realized that I had a much bigger, broader story I wanted to tell, and there was, the, only, the only other way I could tell it was to was to uh, use that as, a, as the clay for, for, a, for a novel. And, um, uh, and, and so I, I, I wrote Horn of Africa. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, and it still goes back and forth. I mean, there's, I, I've done four books of nonfiction, uh, I, some, of them, some of which I probably could, uh, five books actually, counting the second memoir, um, some of which I probably could have turned into a novel but chose, uh, chose not to. Do we have a question over here? How do you come up with names for your characters? <laughs> uh, if, if, I don't know if the, if the mic carried that, but uh, um, she wants to know if, uh, how I come up with names of characters. And uh, a lot of times I steal names of friends. Um, <laughs> And I sort of like combine them a little bit. I may use yours one day. You never know. You know, um, that's that's usually it. Usually it. And then sometimes, like with this guy, uh, uh, Babcock, uh, I don't know. It just it, it it just popped in my head. I said out of nowhere. I said his name's T J Babcock, and uh, uh, but I don't know where that came from. Next question. Uh, oh. I saw him. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. The issues um, that are occurring now down in, in the Arizona and the border about immigration and the drug wars and everything seems to be such an ongoing theme and, and um, very important matter to everybody at this point. 
That's certainly stuff that movies are made of in the future. I wonder if you've been approached already for a movie and whether you have any ideas to carry these or some of these subjects forward, given that you live down there and see these more than we do. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I heard the part about the, the movie, but I didn't get the last part of the question. Uh, whether you had any ideas for a continuation of the subject somewhat, or the subjects that are, are contained in this book into future books. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 this book has been optioned uh, for a film. Um, uh, the option is, is just uh, that you, the writer turns over the film rights to a producer uh, for a modest sum, and then he holds those rights for a period of time, usually a year, sometimes a year and a half. Uh, and uh, if he finds a star, a director, a screenwriter, etc., it gets made into a movie. Um, that, that's, you know, uh, a, a long shot to say the least. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've gotten some other ideas for, for um, uh, novels that might take place uh, down there in the border. They're not really um, in that part of the world anyway. They're not that developed yet, but um, I did come across, um, I was, again, talk about journalism. I was down in Mexico last year doing a story on, the, uh, on this horrendous virtual civil war they're having down there uh, and um, uh, in, the, in uh, the president's efforts to battle the drug cartels, uh, which is shorthand for a very confusing situation. Uh, I was down there for the Atlantic magazine. I did a story about that. But while I was down there, I, I came across this story about a village priest who was uh, in an attempt to battle the influence of the drug smugglers um, in his village and, uh, and the effects they were having on the young boys there, all of whom wanted to become narcos. Um, he was uh, telling the federales, the cops, what the drug lords told him in confession. And um, I was just captivated by that. I mean, you want to talk about moral ambiguity, you know. I mean, it, and, uh, uh, so it seems that I, there better not be any writers in here who steal that damn story either. <laughs> <because> <laughs> But that, uh, that seemed to me a pretty rich uh, uh, vein to mine. <laughs> let's, uh, oh. let's have a question. Let's have a question from Obi. Let's go over here first and then continue. I'm curious about your thoughts of the um, current state of American journalism and particularly its uh, future prospects. <laughs> Do you have any bigger subject I'd like to talk about? <laughs> Small matters like that. Um, well, um, I have a younger son who's a political reporter for the Miami Herald, uh, and uh, he's doing very well there. They, uh, uh, he's actually, he works for the Herald, and, and all of his stories also run in the St. Petersburg Times. Both papers think the world of him, but he wakes up almost every morning uh, thinking he's going to go into the office and he's going to hear, this is our last day of publication. Um, it's kind of like that play that's uh, uh, off-Broadway or, is it off-Broadway or on-Broadway? Uh, uh, alpha, um, what's it called? Uh, alphabet alphabetical, alphabetical Order, which is about a British newspaper that folds back in the 70s. Um, You know, I, I, again, dinosaur, atavism, whatever you want to call me, is that I think the decline of newspapers uh, is just, just awful. Um, I don't see how the, the civic function of newspapers, of both informing the public and, I would say, protecting the public from the depredations either of government or big business, can be carried out by bloggers and uh, um, uh, 
pure web-based journalism. I, I was very pleased to see that this web-based investigative reporting agency, I guess I can call it, called ProPublica, um, came out with a, uh, with a big investigation recently in conjunction with PBS's front line. That was, that was kind of encouraging. But I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm rather distressed uh, to, to see papers in, 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 in newspapers in the condition they are, um, magazines in, in, in the condition they are. I, uh, I'm a print guy. <laughs> I love print. I like to read it. I like to smell it. I like to feel it. I like to write it. Uh, I miss my typewriter. Uh, but that maybe that's because I'm just uh, an old guy. Um, uh, but I, 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 I'm, uh, I, I can't see, so far, electronic journalism fulfilling those, those functions as adequately as print did. Maybe, maybe it will. But I, I'm, not, I'm not overly optimistic. You know. I will say up front, I have not read your book because my question will reflect that. But I will be reading your book. In Arizona, uh, how was it received? Oh, uh, how was it received in Arizona? Um, I, mean, I, I don't know how well it sold there. Um, I was at the Tucson Book Festival with it last year, and I had fairly long lines of people uh, buying it and wanting to sign it. Um, th there have been uh, reviews of it in, uh, in the Tucson uh, and Phoenix papers, and in fact, there's a review here just recently, in, um, and I think it was a web-based um, uh, review service that was quite favorable. And I did hear from friends uh, that, that they all thought I'd gotten it right. Um, in fact, as I did hear about one um, uh, ex-sheriff's uh, deputy from Cochise County, which is a county neighbor, neighboring ours, uh, who was who had been an undercover uh, narc cop for the uh, for the sheriff's department there, and he said, "Man, he says that's he says, that was right on. That's exactly the the way it is." So, I guess the reception's been pretty good. Governor Brewer has not yet banned me from the state, <laughs> anyway, so um, she's probably never heard of me for that matter because I don't think she reads, but. Uh, <laughs> Guess which party I vote for. <laughs> yes, sir. May I ask a quick question about the process? You, I believe, and correct me, indicated that um, you had sort of hit a roadblock when all of a sudden the phone rang and the magazine said, would you please think about doing this? Um, are you constantly confronted by sort of walking on the edge? I mean, you have an idea. You try to develop that, but, but oh, boy, hold on here. Um, just not, I mean, if you, or is this an exception? No, that happens all the time. Uh, but I mean, yeah. to that extent. Oh yeah, even worse. <laughs> uh, you ever dropped something? I mean, yeah, I've dropped, I've dropped, uh, I wrote a whole like 500 page in manuscript form novel that just simply did not work at all. Um, and, uh, I mean, I never published it. And, um, I, uh, even in the midst, halfway through a novel, it, it'll just suddenly die on me sometimes. And, uh, uh, or I'll hate it uh, and want it to die. <laughs> and um, uh, so that's, that's a rather, that's, that's actually fairly, fairly frequent. And is that, this all on your own or does your wife, you know, do you speak in your sleep or something and she says, dear, the time has come. <laughs> what, what, I mean, what, does... I mean, is this, are you grappling with this all by yourself? Oh, oh, no, I, I inflict this on uh, Leslie quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, uh, she, gets, she gets pretty sick of uh, hearing it. She says to me that, you know, I mean, every book, halfway through, and I say, this is crap, this is no good, this is not going anywhere. And she says, oh, you just you keep saying that, you know, and just sort of like shut up and write. And, and, uh, and um, so... Uh, and then sometimes you know you you, you just wrestle it wrestle with it by your, by yourself uh, because uh, um, 
It's a, it's a thing you can only resolve. It's, it's, sometimes it's like writing a novel. It's like, I feel like, like some mathematician who's trying to work out, you know, one of those, those equations that have been around for 500 years and that nobody can figure out. And, and sometimes it feels that way to me. Back Andrew, that way? there's a question back. Andrew, can you pass the microphone back to Dean Nakai? What is your advice to the novice writer? Um, well, if you can avoid becoming one, uh, <laughs> do so. Um, it's, uh, you, you know, uh, well, first of all, is that um, it really is a calling. It's, it really is a vocation, almost like you know, the, the priesthood or something like that. In other words, you, you can't not write. Um, it's, uh, I even thought that after I did this book, I had some notion in my mind I was going to quit and retire. And uh, I found myself at such loose ends. Uh, you know, I felt useless, pointless, um, and uh, I, I couldn't find enough hobbies to fill up the day. Uh, and I realized that, uh, you know, I said that I'll probably, I'll probably, uh, if I, my dad died this year at age 94, and, uh, and I said, I'll probably, if I live that long, I'll probably be scribbling like this, you know, and then just, <laughs> my head will hit the desk and that'll be it, even if, even if I'm not publishing anything. So that's the first thing, is you're compelled to do it. Uh, the other advice that everybody gives the novice, are you talking about a fiction writer or any writer? is, and I alluded to it in my talk, uh, show it, don't tell it. In other words, dramatize the, you dramatize the story, you don't need to comment on it or grab the reader by the throat and uh, shove his face into the story. So you see, this is what it means, you know, kind of thing. Uh, you, you, should, um, uh, you should write every day preferably at the same time of day. And regard it, even though it's a calling, a vocation, it's also a job. And so it requires a lot, a lot, a lot of self-discipline. Um, so, you know, some people I know start writing at midnight and quit at five in the morning. Some start at five in the morning, quit at one in the afternoon, or whatever. Uh, but that's their routine, and they do it almost constantly. Uh, I know I do. I'm always writing something, almost, almost every day. Um, so let's see, so self-discipline, uh, and uh, show it, don't tell it. Um, and if you have to do it, you'll become a writer. Um, I mean, you know, right along those lines. I, I was asked that question once at a, at a class that I gave in the University of Miami in Florida. And I was asked that very question, and I wrote down the names of all these famous American writers, I'm going back to Edgar Allan Poe, and I said, Edgar Allan Poe died an alcoholic at 40. So-and-so committed suicide. So-and-so a drug addict. So-and-so divorced 17 times, you know. And, and, and I, I asked this class, they were all young people, and I said, so how many of you still want to be writers? And, and there was only one, there was a, a, an older woman there. By older, I meant she was like in her 30s. And, uh, uh, and she raised her hand, and I said, well, you're going to be a writer because obviously you're crazy enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So. Let's make this the last question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next. No, uh, Another question. I'm sorry. All right, we'll take two more. Okay. okay. That is a young have you lady had the same me. editor through these books? Do you have a good working relationship with... Your editor or editor? Um, no. Um, <laughs> I've had the same agent since uh, 1975. And he and I are, and we've done business for 40, how many years is that now? 35? Uh, yeah. 
that's why I'm a writer. I can't do math. And uh, 35 years, and we've done business that whole time on a handshake. I mean, we've never signed a contract or anything. But I've, I've been with four publishers, and, had, and, I, and my first editor, I worked pretty well with her, and we had a falling out. And, uh, and I can't say that I've had, uh, to be candid about it, the happiest experiences with editors since, in the sense that, unlike a lot of writers, I like to be edited. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes, I do a lot of stuff wrong, uh, I, uh, uh, even though I was an ex-news you know, hack, uh, I tend to write too long, uh, too wordy, um, all of this stuff. And uh, modern editors, modern book editors, seem to just not edit anymore. Um, they acquire writers, you know, they sign them up, and then it seems to me that they get into the office at 10, um, go to lunch at 11, come back at 2, leave at three, and then golf. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I've had to, for example, now there's one editor that I, I hire um, on a, like a freelance basis. She's really, really good. She's uh, nuts and bolts on structure, on line editing, and so forth. And, uh, and I've hired her for the last three books, and, and she and I will go over a manuscript for six weeks to two months. Uh, exchanging emails, letters, phone calls, and um, and then uh, the real polishing is I, uh, Leslie, my wife, is an editor, and and a really terrific line editor, uh, and uh, brutal sometimes. I mean, I sometimes get manuscripts back, and she writes in the margins, yuck, <laughs> <laughs> literally. But uh, but that's that's how I've done it. Yeah. What inspired you to become a writer? Well, as, as, as I said, I, I, I didn't, I, didn't I, I had it like a compulsion to do it. Um, now, admittedly, early, early in my university training, uh, I, I, for two years I studied aeronautical engineering. Um, I, uh, my father was a, was a machinist who eventually developed in, into a, like a mechanical engineer virtually, even though he didn't have a degree in it. Uh, and he was technically a brilliant man. Um, and he wanted me to be an engineer in the worst way. And, uh, and, and I, I went to Purdue University and studied aeronautical engineering for two years and, and uh, dropped out in lieu of flunking out. Uh, and um, and, and I, I started to think maybe I should be a writer because um, I, I think in my second semester sophomore year, I had uh, straight A's in uh, English and in German, and I was flunking physics, chemistry, and, uh, and calculus. So I kind of thought that that's not a good sign. And, um, but mostly it was kind of a compulsion. I know with the first book, um, with A Rumor of War, that was really like a, an obsession. Uh, the whole time, almost the entire nine years that I worked for the Chicago Tribune, I was, I was working on that book whenever I could. I mean, I used to work, uh, as a newspaper guy, I used to work 12-hour days sometimes, and as a foreign correspondent, I was all over the place. So I could only work on the book whenever I could, had a minute. Um, and, uh, but I was, I, 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 I couldn't get away from it. I just had, had to tell it, and that's just continued. It's, it's an obsession or a compulsion or a, a calling. Well, thank okay. you so thank much. Thank you much.